All right, I think we can go ahead and get started then. So thanks everyone for coming out to hear me show for my own company today. Um, actually, I think even if you're not in the market for a uh, deep learning platform, commercial platform, I think we'll have a lot to uh, tell you about how we've used Ray in some pretty interesting ways that will hopefully be a benefit for you and whatever you do uh, with Ray. So thank you. Um, I'm Travis Adair. Uh, I'm the CTO of Predibase. Uh, previously, I worked for a number of years uh, on Uber's Michelangelo team. Um, and you know, at Predibase, we're building a low-code low deep learning platform built on top of a lot of the open source technologies that came out of Uber AI, like uh, the Ludwig project, which I'll talk about, as well as Horovod, which I think a lot of you have heard a lot about uh, during this conference. And so what we'll talk about specifically is I'll give you an introduction to Predibase and what uh, we mean by declarative machine learning. I'll talk about Ludwig, the open source declarative ML framework that we're built on top of. I'll explain how we've uh, made Ludwig production ready by uh, integrating it fully with Ray. And then I'll also talk about what we're doing on the Predibase side with uh, an abstraction that we call engines, which is a serverless multi-tenant layer that sits on top of Ray. And so to start, I want to talk a little bit about this declarative ML concept. So we believe that today there's a bit of a false dichotomy in the industry between people who believe that the only way to do machine learning is to write low-level APIs like PyTorch or TensorFlow, and people who believe that ML is essentially a solved problem and you can just throw lots and lots of compute at it and you know, AutoML will eventually give you whatever result you want. And so on the low-level side, uh, they have the benefit of being very flexible, but there are a lot of downsides to this approach. Um, oftentimes the infrastructure is very uh, do-it-yourself. You have to stitch together the best in breed solutions by hand for your particular problem. It's a very fragmented landscape. There aren't enough experts who know how to do this stuff, and oftentimes these experts are uh, only experts in this particular subset of these technologies, and so you need a huge team uh, with lots and lots of time to get everything into production. And so as an example of this, you know, oftentimes a pattern that we've seen at companies like, like Uber when we were there was that you would have a project that maybe does intent classification, that has some thousands of lines of TensorFlow, it takes five months, and then your second project maybe is 900 lines of PyTorch, and there's no ability to reuse any of the things that you did for the first project for the second one. Same for the third project, ad infinitum. And so you have all these bespoke solutions that lead to lots and lots of tech debt because there's no way to kind of reuse components across them, right? And so on the other side of the spectrum, you have this AutoML stuff, which is very simple, very easy to use, but lots of people have complaints about AutoML that's a black box, it takes away control from the customer. And so what happens is someone trains a model, it's not quite what they want, there's nothing they can do to improve it, and so they churn out and go back to the low-level frameworks. And so what's our answer to this problem? So our answer is what we call declarative deep learning, and we uh, have an open source project that I encourage you to check out called Ludwig, that is uh, the, the first declarative deep learning framework. And the nice thing about declarative deep learning is that's very easy to get going. Like if you want to train a model that does, in this case, like text classification, uh, it's just those six lines of YAML, that's all it takes, right? But if you want to go deeper and say, I actually want to use BERT for this uh, model, and I want to use a dropout rate of 5%, et cetera. You can control all of those parameters, and you can even go all the way down to doing hyperparameter search over individual models, like neural architecture search, or hyperparameter search over individual parameters of the model. So all the flexibility is there to go as deep as you want, but the benefit is all of this complexity is very simple to express through this YAML instead of having to drill down into you know, the classic Python, PyTorch world where um, you know, you're having to constantly uh, ship around Jupyter notebooks between your colleagues, et cetera. And so we believe that this gives us the best, best of both worlds. It gives you a high-level abstraction and opens the door to non-expert users and expert users alike to work together on solving ML problems. And as I said, I, we pioneered these with Ludwig as well as another project called Overton. Um, so definitely check out Ludwig uh, to learn more about how this all works. And so with Predibase, we're expanding upon what we've done with Ludwig and also building on top of a state-of-the-art ML infrastructure uh, that's built on top of Horvod as well as Ray. And I also want to call out our very simple ways of interacting with the tool. So we have dev several different entry points to Predibase. Uh, there's a web UI. Uh, there's also a very powerful uh, SQL extension that we call PQL that's shown there that allows you to do model creation and model prediction uh, as easy as you would write a SQL query. And there's also a Python SDK, which since a lot of Ray users are Python users, that's what I'll be focusing most of the time on today. And so the way that typically you use Predibase is like this is the, the core loop. You have your structured data in Snowflake or uh, in uh, BigQuery or some other data warehouse or data lake like S3. 
you train a model, you operationalize it either, either using PQL or SQL-like interface for kind of BI and analytics workloads, or you deploy it to a REST endpoint, and then you can kind of go back and iterate on that over time. And I want to uh, show you this example. So I think in a lot of the times when people show these Python examples, it's like there's a lot of, you know, like, oh, there's actually some, you know, thousand line code function or something that you're not showing here. But that's actually not the case here. This is literally all it takes to get them all into production with Predibase, which I think is a really powerful thing about the low code aspect. So it's really not like a fully no code solution that there is a lot of control and a lot of uh, advanced functionality that you can do. But what you see here is we're essentially just connecting to some Snowflake warehouse. Uh, we're creating a data set out of a table, like in this case, support tickets. Uh, from that, we can create what we call a model draft from which we can iterate on you know, setting the encoder, in this case, to be BERT. Uh, we've already defined what our label is there in the first line. We train a model, which then becomes an immutable artifact in Predibase. And then once we have that model, we can do batch prediction on a pandas data frame. Uh, we can do prediction on uh, another Snowflake table and then write it out to a, a third Snowflake table. We can do these kind of slicing and dicing of the data with PQL to, in this case, say, you know, I want to predict uh, the label for this uh, data set where the creation time is greater than such and such. And then we can also deploy the model to rest. And so all of this can be done in just these few lines of code. And so the benefits for Ray users of this is that uh, I, I want to focus on three things in particular. One, this high-level API that Ludwig provides, which is this low-code modular interface that allows you to bring faster iteration, lower time to value, it gives you best-in-class models and reusability. And then the full integration of Ludwig on Ray, which bundles end-to-end -end the full Ray ML stack. So you have cutting-edge Ray features like Ray datasets, uh, Dask on Ray, Horvat on Ray, all bundled together and optimized for performance and unifies the training, hyperopt, as well as serving. And then finally, the serverless component, which is the Predibase engines that I'll talk about. So these are Ray cluster resources that automatically are right-sized to your data and model workloads. And it removes the complexity of figuring out what's the right hardware that I need to run my training job and allows us to auto-scale to these heterogeneous hardware configurations that mix together CPUs and GPUs for different parts of the workload. So first, let's talk about the high-level API. So I think this, to me, describes like a lot of the state of the art of uh, data science today, is that new research comes out, which is indicated at the top there, TabNet, VIT, T5, et cetera. And then some person on the internet, like a researcher, will read the paper and then write some Jupyter notebooks that implement it or write some GitHub repositories. And then you have these verticalized data science teams that exist within organizations that will then try to cobble together solutions by pulling you know, code from a Git repository or from a Jupyter notebook, et cetera. And then you know, they all need to try to cobble these things together. And there's not really any cohesive way of like how we're going to modularize this or use it or share it across our team. And so what we believe is a much better and more natural way to do this is that the people who read the papers or write the papers even and implement them in this code can implement these components within Ludwig so that they can be reused for multiple different tasks. And then within Predibase, we provide an enterprise layer of like this uh, repository feature that I'll talk a little bit about, um, as well as uh, you know, lots of uh, features around the infrastructure abstraction that allows these teams to kind of collaborate together through this declarative interface and take advantage of all these state-of-the-art model architectures without having to kind of you know, cobble together solutions from many disparate uh, places, right? And so all of this is really possible because of the Ludwig architecture. So there's this architecture that was pioneered with Ludwig called encoder, combiner, decoder. And the way it works is that every feature of your data set, input or output feature, can be represented as a specific data type, which then gets transformed in its own way depending on what that data type is. So if it's a text feature, we might uh, convert it into a hidden representation with BERT or VIT for image or any other types of models. And then we combine all these hidden representations together in this combiner layer, which could be tabnet or concatenation with like a multi-layer perceptron, lots of different uh, types. And then whatever your output feature is gets its own decoder, which then gives you the prediction. So it could be like a classification result or a regression, et cetera. And so this is kind of the underlying abstraction and the, on the deep learning side that makes this modularity possible. And the flexibility is very high as well. So you could have you know, regression tasks, speech verification, text classification, forecasting, binary classification, image captioning, lots of different things you can do. And it's all as simple as just these very small configurations. So here you can see lots of different ways that you can combine these things in different ways to uh, achieve the kind of result that you're looking for. 
And now let me talk a little bit about the model repo that I mentioned. So one nice thing about Predibase is that it's very easy to iterate on your models over time if you want to try different things. So the first thing you might do is build a baseline model without spe specifying anything. It's kind of like an AutoML feature in a way. You train the model. You then want to try a different combiner. Say, well, the AutoML system selected whatever. Let's try TabNet. Train it again. Maybe you want to do hyperparameter optimization over your learning rate. That's, again, just a one-line uh, configuration change. And then maybe you want to try a different type of normalization. And then once again, that's just a simple change, and you can train a model. And what do you get out of this? You get a very nice lineage. This is not the Predibase UI, by the way. It's just a little <laughs> uh, visual representation. But um, essentially, what you get out of it is this very nice lineage that gives you multiple different things. One is kind of the, kind of, uh, the DAG, essentially, that shows you, you know, how the models evolved over time. Uh, you also get the, different, the diffs between the YAMLs, so it's very easy to see you know, the underlying uh, declarative representation, like what has changed, and it's usually just a couple lines. And then you also get that so sort of nice visibility into how the model performance is changing over time as well. And so if you compare this to like, you know, someone shipping a Jupyter notebook to someone else who then has to figure out how to try to run that in their environment and make some changes and then send it back to someone else, it's a much more natural way to iterate on your models over time. Next, I want to talk about the Ludwig on Ray component, particularly since this is the Ray Summit. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff we're doing here. Um, so in Ludwig 0.4, which came out about a year ago, we introduced Ludwig on Ray as a backend. It combines multiple different steps of, uh, of pre-processing, training, and evaluation all together using different parts of the Ray ecosystem. So we use Dask on Ray for pre-processing, Horvat on Ray for training, and then Dask on Ray for model evaluation. <clears throat> and we also provide uh, Raytune as an abstraction, which I showed you a little bit of through the SDK, which again we use. Uh, I think one thing that's particularly interesting is that in Ludwig on Ray, again, all open source, you can do distributed training per trial. So you can also test out different uh, parallel configurations um, very naturally just by modifying the config. And so one thing that I think is very uh, interesting about what we're doing with Ludwig on Ray and Predibase is that we're solving a lot of the nitty-gritty optimization problems for you. So, you know, while Ray is very powerful and very flexible, oftentimes there are some challenges that arise uh, when you're trying to eke out the optimal performance um, for different tasks. And so, you know, with Ludwig, we try to hide all that complexity from you. And a really good example of this is what we've done with Ray datasets. So we've worked very closely with uh, the folks at Ray and AnyScale, uh, particularly Clark uh, Zenzo, who gave a talk earlier, uh, with Ray datasets. And what I think is really powerful about this is that, you know, without making any changes to the user-facing side of the code, we swapped out our previous data loader with Ray datasets, which you can see here uh, now is a bridge between the Dask and the Horvod por portions of training, and achieved some pretty impressive results. So previously with Petastorm, we had a big bottleneck that existed with tabular data. And as you can see here, training this particular model, which I believe is the Higgs boson model, which is about uh, one gigabyte of parquet data, um, you can see that over time, um, the performance of Ray datasets was much faster in terms of gain to good performance than using Petastorm. And it got there uh, also to a higher overall performance as well. And that's in large part due to the global shuffle that uh, Ray datasets provides, which Petastorm is not able to provide. And you can see that it was also able to get much better results as we scaled up to more GPUs. So the scaling efficiency of the pipeline uh, so was a sustained 92%. Um, as compared to Petastorm, which was quickly dropping off as we scaled up to more GPUs. And so this is some of the example of how Ludwig abstracts away a lot of this complexity and gives you the best in class performance without the user even having to be aware of it. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing with uh, the serverless abstraction of engines. So one thing that I think is often uh, overlooked when we talk about uh, doing distributed training, et cetera, is how exactly you figure out what the right set of resources should be to do your model training. And so one thing that um, I think a lot of people have not yet started doing, but we make very heavy use of on the Predibase side, is heterogeneous ray clusters. So instead of just having one worker type, we actually mix together multiple worker types uh, depending on the workload. And so we might reserve some CPU instances for doing uh, pre-processing and data ingest, and some GPU instances for doing training. And then we do fancy things with the Ray API, like saying num CPUs equals zero on the GPU workers to make sure that none of the data processing tasks actually land on those machines, right? And the way that we can achieve this is, again, through the, the, the declarative aspect of Ludwig, right? So we know which model types are more complex than others. And so we know which ones require GPUs versus which ones, you know, if they're, for example, the forecasting and binary classification down the bottom right, 
are the models being used? We don't necessarily need to scale up to a lot of GPUs. Maybe you know, CPUs is sufficient for these model architectures, right? So we're very uh, capable through the declarative representation, which you wouldn't have if you were just writing Python, right? Um, able to determine, okay, what's the right type of hardware we need to train this model? And we also kind of take that a step further in terms of our ability to run multiple parallel workloads on array cluster at a time. So here's an example of how you would normally uh, run some kind of uh, different workloads on array cluster. So you might have here uh, one user uh, who wants to queue up some work that's going to do some pre-processing, uh, followed by data ingest and training. So this is all like stuff that Ludwig will do for you. And then at the top there you can see what's happening in Ray under the hood. Uh, and this is assuming that we're running on like a Kubernetes cluster. So we're going to acquire the node uh, from the Kubernetes cluster, take some time to image it, et cetera. Then we're going to actually do the pre-processing, and then there's going to be some time that's going to be spent acquiring the GPU node and then running the actual training. And then you can see that after the pre-processing completes, some of those CPU resources can be freed up, uh, while others will be retained for doing the data ingest and shuffling. And so as you can see, there's no ability to really like reuse resources across these two different workloads. And so the total time to completion is exactly kind of the horizontal width of these boxes. But what we've been able to do with Predibase is um, be able to pack multiple different workloads onto the same Ray clusters when it's uh, uh, optimal to do so. And so the really nice benefit here is that we're able to take those resources that were otherwise sitting idle in the cluster, and instead of just releasing them, uh, you know, through the Ray autoscaler, we're able to essentially take those resources and transfer them over to the other workload. So the total time to completion is actually reduced by a significant amount, right? So this kind of optimization is possible because of the fact that we provide uh, these Ray clusters as an abstraction as opposed to giving the user kind of direct access. So that's a difference between, you know, the low code versus full code uh, way of, of thinking about the problem. And a quick kind of uh, SDK example of how we do this, how a, an end user thinks about it in Predibase, um, is they create an engine, which again is like this virtual Ray cluster abstraction. And in this case, they say, you know, I want to use uh, this type of CPU node, this type of GPU node, what kind of the min and max number of instances are, what the auto suspend timeout is. And then they just use that engine for any one of their uh, functions. So in this case, we have a PQL query that wants to predict the sales price. Uh, from uh, the housing prices table for all the uh, houses in Los Angeles. And then they just give it that engine. Uh, they can also optionally set their default engine as well. So here's where we kind of get into the nitty gritty of like the Predibase architecture. Uh, so peeling back the kernel a little bit. So we run everything on top of uh, Kubernetes. Um, and so uh, we use very extensively the Kubray project, which uh, some of you may have heard about earlier. Um, and so what essentially we do is we have a single control plane that uses uh, Temporal as a workflow orchestration layer that then creates the Ray cluster resources using the Kubray operator. And then Kubernetes will provision those Ray clusters um, on behalf of, of uh, the tenants. And then within that, we have a Temporal worker that actually runs inside the Ray cluster uh, that pulls for um, model training jobs to be performed uh, uh, or other workloads like PQL queries, et cetera, from the temporal server, then executes it using the standard Ray.remote task scheduler. And then from there, the rest is pretty standard Ludwig on Ray, uh, with the exception that we also have some deep integrations with data lakes and data warehouses to, for example, pull data out of Snowflake or BigQuery, write data results back to Snowflake or BigQuery, et cetera. And so one reason why we do this instead of using a jobs-like API um, is that because we have this PQL capability, which is like a SQL execution engine, right? We need to be able to support these interactive workloads. So for example, if a user wants to say, um, select star from my table, predict this thing, oh, I actually want to slice on this other set of data, you don't want each of those to be its own uh, Ray cluster because then in that case, you're having to constantly uh, create, tear down, create, tear down resources you'd much rather be able to have those uh, resources be hot and fresh so that you can you know, very quickly get results back to the user. And so that's why we use this kind of uh, live Ray cluster abstraction instead of just you know, thinking of it as like a batch processing job. And all of this architecture is uh, multi-cloud native. So uh, our control plane that I showed you before, which was this orange box here, um, can also be uh, reused across different cloud providers. So uh, what we do is we run all the compute within the customer's environment. 
So if the customer is running in uh, G uh, Google Cloud or AWS or Azure, um, all of that can be done from a single control plane that we manage. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we don't have to uh, worry about data management on our side, right? So all the data management, um, you know, we move the compute to where the data is essentially instead of having to tell users like, hey, move your data into our environment, right? So we're not a data warehouse. Uh, we're just providing the uh, ML, ML layer on top of the data. All right, and uh, I actually finished way early. <laughs> so hopefully there'll be time for questions. Um, but yeah, thank you for uh, coming to my talk today. Um, please check us out, that is our website. We're also on Twitter. Uh, we publish some stuff on Medium, a lot of it's Ludwig open source content. And of course, uh, you can find Ludwig on GitHub as well. And I encourage you to check that out. And with that, um, open it up to any questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'd love for you to go back to the slide on the different technologies you used for different um, phases of the machine learning lifecycle. Um, on there, you mentioned using Dask on Ray for certain operations and mm -hmm. Ludwig on Ray for different ones. Uh, I'd love if you could explain some of the pros and cons and why you sort of made the decision to add extra like technologies. Right, right, okay. So um, maybe it's actually even better to show you this one because I think it's a little bit simpler. So. Um, Ludwig, uh, so this is all Ludwig, essentially. Um, so Ludwig is like a top level layer for this declarative ML system. And under the hood, we use Dask on Ray, Horvat on Ray um, as components within the architecture. And the reason for that is that we um, don't just take uh, data that's like uh, ready to be fed into the, the PyTorch model, right? Like the data might be raw strings, or it might be unnormalized integers, or you know unindexed categorical features. So what we need to do is run the kind of data transformation, which could be you know a fit operation to like for normalization, computing like mean and standard deviation or whatever, um, or computing like you know what the um, uh, tokenization should be of the text features, et cetera. So and then applying that, and so that all happens in Dask on Ray today. Although we're trying to move some of that to Ray datasets to kind of get better pipelining, and then the training part itself happens on Horvat on Ray, uh, with data being fed from Ray datasets, and that's you know to get that distributed data parallel training aspect. Um, so it's ultimately to answer your question a, a question a matter of trying to fuse together these parts that are normally thought of as separate into a single end-to-end -end job, and then the really cool thing about it is that. Because we do the pre-processing and the model inference together in one application layer, we can also compile a servable model that encompasses both of those into one torch scriptable like thing that can be served in like you know Ray serve or Trident, et cetera. Um, and that means that you don't have to figure out how to rewrite your data transformation code uh, to be servable, right? Because normally you don't want to use pandas at serving time in, in most cases. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. My name is Nikunj. Um, in the beginning, you showed a slide where uh, we talked about AutoML and then making it uh, more complicated with advanced use cases. Um, looking at that slide, it feels like it could be more suited, like the entire uh, application could be more suited for like speech or text, speech, vision-based models, and less so for like the very structured data set like recommendation systems or fraud detection. Is that a fair understanding? Yeah, so we actually um, have done a lot to, uh, you know, in some ways I think the question is like uh, a matter of, you know, where deep learning is at as well. Like, you know, is deep learning state of the art on some of these tasks? So what I would say is that definitely um, I think uh, cases where you have NLP, computer vision, or in particular mixed modality data sets, which I think is probably the most underrepresented but most real world scenario is like you have companies that have some text from their users, like comments, some images that they've uploaded, plus some metadata about them, like who they are, where they live, et cetera. Like ideally, you'd like to be able to use all of those things in a model, right? Not just the tabular data. So to me, I think the reality is that like, yes, people do a lot of like tabular only problems today, but in reality, you want to be able to combine the tabular and the mix and the more rich data together. And that's exactly what Ludwig is able to do for you. Now, if you do only have tabular data, Deep learning, you know, sometimes will do well with tabnet. Sometimes it's not the best. 
That's why in Ludwig 0.6, we're adding support for gradient boosted trees as an option. So the same syntax, you can just say model equals light GBM, and then it will use light GBM on Ray. Um, but by default, we still, you know, for full flexibility, like there are some limitations about light GBM, like you only have one output feature. It only supports the tabular data types for now. Um, so for full flexibility, like the kind of deep neural network and coder combiner decoder architecture still is the way to go. But you know, that option is something that we're adding into the framework as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I have seen the previous slide says that uh, the, the model right sizing, mm, yeah. right to decide the, how, many, how many results will be used uh, before the model training. So I'm wondering how to, how to do that because uh, in my personal experience, it's very hard to do that because uh, when we submit a distributed system, a distributed training job, we cannot know that, so sometimes it will be suffer from side, like uh, out of memory error. So the yeah, yeah. the job will right be, and and the we deploy it with the deployment, so it will create again and uh, out of memory again, right? So I'm very interesting about that. Mm. Thanks. So one thing that we do in Ludwig is there's a feature that we enable like by default in Predibase that you can enable in Ludwig called batch size equals auto, and the nice thing about that is that it will. Um, try to auto detect what's the biggest batch size I can fit in my buffer before I have an out of memory error, right? And then based on that, we can then make sure that we, like in terms of vertical scale, get the right um, size of uh, the right batch size to basically saturate the GPU memory, right? Um, now, there are still some cases where even with that, you'll get some like weird out of memory errors. And so the nice thing about Ludwig is that you notice that there are a lot of parameters in there, but the user isn't specifying all of them. So we know which parameters actually can contribute to things like memory pressure. And so what we can do is if the user didn't specify those parameters and there's an out of memory error that occurs, we can do a retry where we like scale down some of those parameters and then try it again. And then you know, hopefully it will eventually succeed. And in the event where the user specified all those parameters and they just said, you know, like I want a, a million batch size or something, then we just have to tell them, like, okay, well, we couldn't actually make this work. Like, please reduce the batch size, right? Yes. Uh, really simple question. Uh, I'm curious. Um, with, from like the UI perspective, and I don't know if you can tell us this, but do you feel like customers are more likely to want to use the UI mm -hmm. or more likely to use the SDK? Or have you seen anything like that? It's a great question. Yeah. So it definitely depends on the persona. Um, so I would say that originally we didn't have the Python SDK. The Python SDK was a response to our customers that were wanting to do more advanced features. And yeah, shout out to Connor, who was the one who wrote that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the Python SDK actually has seen a lot of adoption from our customers because you know, the, typically people will want to do things like EDA, like exploratory data analysis in their Jupyter notebook. And then they can run the Python SDK in that same environment. And the nice thing about our Python SDK is that it doesn't, you can run it in a Jupyter Notebook and not incur a lot of tech debt because all of those artifacts are you know, version controlled and managed on the back end. So whatever you run there is not something that you have to treat as like you know, a source of truth, like it all lives in Predibase. Now the UI on the other hand is still very useful I think for like people who are like first time users or maybe more the analyst persona that's not as comfortable writing Python. So, you know, the UI is a very simple way to get familiar with the tool, particularly if you don't know what all the options are, like what are all the different, you know, parameters I can even configure. The UI, we've done a, a huge investment on making it very clear to the user, kind of like the settings page in VS Code, like what are the commonly selected parameters, like what are the ones that give you the most bang for your buck, what do they do, like when would you change, set the value to one value versus another. So I think the UI is a really great learning tool. Uh, but then, you know, the SDK and, you know, even doing some things with the PQL query language to create models are there for, like, more advanced users who are ready to productionize things. Yeah, sorry if it's uh, very, uh, uh, I'm new to this, so I don't quite understand. When you have an encoder and decoder, ah, yeah, you have yeah. the combiner. Uh, what exactly is happening if I have, let's say, two input feature to one single auto feature, is a combiner similar to working in the latent space, the transformer yes. tokens, what are these? It, yeah, it's a great question. I, I did try to gloss over this because there's a lot of complexity to it. But yeah, essentially the way that we think about it is, like let's say I have a text feature 
and then I have a numerical feature or something like that. It's like, how do I build a model that can incorporate both text and you know, like tabular features at, at, at once? And the solution is exactly to create embeddings into a, a latent space, right? So the encoders create the embeddings, and then the, with those embeddings, we can combine them in a number of different ways, one of which might be uh, to concatenate them all into a vector. And so we have a, uh, a combiner called a, concat com a combiner that does exactly that and then feeds it through a multilayer perceptron. Or you could use a transformer, like, so you can have an attention mechanism that sits over each of these latent vectors. And so that's another type of, trans uh, another type of combiner we have. We also have a tabnet one, which is like an attention mechanism plus some other fancy things that try to simulate a, a decision tree. So there are lots of different options available to you there, but that's essentially the way that these things are like, you can take these like multiple different modalities and combine them all together into a single model. And so the encoders, the combiners, and the decoders are all learnable by default. So you know, you'll back propagate fully from the decoders through the encoders. It's not the case that like any of these are like fixed parameters, right? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, actually, we're at the end of oh, the session, okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's take remaining questions offline. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. I'm really glad we got to have some good Q&A. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing with Ludwig or Prebase, please come talk to me. Yeah.